All right. Um, welcome back, everyone, to the third day. Uh, my sorry, my apologies. The fourth day of our summer school. Uh, we're we're glad to have uh, excellent speakers today as well uh, as we've had for the rest of the week. And uh, today we will dive into uh, opening and demystifying the black box of machine learning and AI, and understanding how we can use tools from interpretability and uh, various other techniques to uh, to really understand what these networks and uh, machine learning models are are doing uh, you you've had some experience with training machine learning models and deep learning models so far and uh, today you'll you'll learn techniques on how to how to really get into these models and understand exactly what they're doing uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, first speaker for uh, today Dr. Amy McGovern. Uh, we might we might just give it a moment before uh, we get started. All right, so here we have uh, Dr. Amy McGovern. Um, Amy is a, is a Lloyd G. and Joyce Austin presidential professor in the School of Computer Science and adjunct professor in the School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, she's an NSF Career Award winner and her research focuses on developing novel spatial temporal data mining methods for real world applications, particularly focusing on severe weather. Thank you very much, Amy, for joining us today, and over to you. Thank you. I'm going to share a PowerPoint here. Okay. Can everybody see that fine? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So um, we're, this is part one of two parts of the talk. So I'm doing the first hour, and Emma ebert -Upoff is going to do the second hour. We're both working on talking about how to look inside the black box of machine learning. Before I get started, I want to show the pictures of all of my students. Um, two of these are former students, um, one of whom is David John Gagne, who's been helping to run this summer school, and uh, Ryan Lagerquist, who helped to teach on Monday, who just finished his PhD in my research group. But all of these students have contributed to the results that I'm going to show you. So I want to thank them. Okay, so before we get going, I want to talk about some ideas as to some motivation as to why we want to look inside the black box. And this one is particularly relevant to recent times, but also it should have been relevant all along. One of the things that is said sort of thinking about the AI algorithms, you think about them as you might think about them as neutral because they're based on math, but they're not really neutral. And David talked about this a little bit on Monday in his opening talk. And I wanted to link to a couple of things here. And in particular, there's an essay, um, the URL is right there. Uh, that just came out a couple days ago talking about how we have an ethical obligation to help people peer inside the black box of machine learning. And so I really want to emphasize that what we're doing and what Emma is going to talk about and all the other methods that exist for peering inside the black box are really important. And you might not think that it applies to earth science data quite so much, but it really does. And as our climate is changing, we need to be able to make sure that we're using our AI for the greater good of humanity. And we, the human programmers, need to do that. And so I also have some references over on the side if you're interested in reading more. But um, that essay is a good start as well. Um, so the other half of the motivation is that this, this XKCD cartoon, which shows up a lot in a lot of different places, and I just realized you can't see the URL at the bottom, but it is there. Um, it, I, I think David even used it. It's, it's a popular one, but it is basically what the public thinks machine learning is, that you just take your machine learning system, you stir it around until things start looking right, which is basically meaning that it's a black box and nobody understands what's inside it. And that's not really true. There are lots of methods out there that show you the inside of the, of the, of the machine learning black box. And a couple of things that we could do um, for, uh, for model interpretation and visualization. So what could we, how the ways we could think about that we could use it. We could use it while we're doing the development of our system. We could use 
model interpretation and visualization to see whether our machine learning model is emphasizing a particular feature that we know is really physically relevant or perhaps not emphasizing a feature that we know is relevant or is re irrelevant. So has it done something completely off the wall? Um, we can say in what situations is it working well and poorly and we want to do all that before we deploy our model because we really want to understand as we're developing in case we need to fix anything. And then during deployment, we want to see what the machine learning is doing that's physical. We want to improve the confidence of the people who are actually using the machine learning model. And we potentially could use machine learning to, uh, to learn new science. And I think Emma's going to emphasize that more in her talk. I'm going to talk more about the just peering inside it. But overall, we really want to use the model interpretation and visualization techniques to improve both our understanding and the prediction of, this, of the weather phenomena. So when uh, David asked me to talk today, he asked me to talk not just about deep learning methods, but about um, methods that can work across all types, types of machine learning models. So you learned about decision trees, for example, earlier this week. And so I'm going to start, this is my outline, I'll keep coming back to it. Um, we're gonna start with a method that works only on tree-based machine learning, and then methods that are considered to be model agnostic. And model agnostic means they can work on both deep learning and non-deep learning methods. So they're, they're agnostic to what model it is you're using. And then there are some particular methods that work only on deep learning methods, and we'll work on those at the end. Well, hopefully the animation is working here. The first one that I wanted to talk about, I actually don't it's not one that I like to emphasize, but it is one that gets used over and over again. Um, and that is impurity importance. And the reason that it gets used over and over again is that it's implemented in scikit-learn, which means that people who are trying random forests can literally type out with one line and get what they think is the, impur impur the importance score. But it turns out that it's just very specifically the impurity importance score. So the way that it works, is that the importance, so I have sort of a fake forest here. You notice that it's really shallow. It's only got three trees and it's only got a couple of, of variables on it. And I put the variables, they're just A, B, C, and D. And they're colored in the trees themselves. They're colored by how many examples they are covered. So the root node always sees all the examples. And then as you go down the tree, different number of examples might split down different layers of the tree. And then at the top, we're showing the importance scores so that the deeper red ones are more important. So the impurity importance, it ranks each particular node by how often it is basically how much, how many examples it's seeing and the impurity score at that node. And so the higher scores are meaning that the node is high up in the tree and it's involved in more splits, meaning it's seeing more examples. And one reason that this gets used in addition to the fact that it's implemented in scikit-learn is that it's an order one method. That means if you're not computer science, it means it's a constant time. It's done as the tree and the forest are built and so it's literally a lookup table and it's very, very fast to use. But the biggest downside is that it only works on trees. Um, so what I wanna do is I'm gonna show you a comparison method. And then after we've talked about these two methods, we're gonna look at how they work on a particular um, earth science problem. So permutation importance is a model agnostic method. And it works in four different ways, and I'm not gonna give the algorithm for all four of them, but I have an animation and a discussion for two of them, and then the others work the other way. So there's two flavors that you can go forward and backward, and then the other flavor is that you can go either single or multi-pass, and we'll talk about that. Um, it's model agnostic, it works on any machine learning model. So you can do this on deep learning, though it is somewhat computationally intensive. You can use it to address correlations among variables, which is really, really nice. And you can do it repeatedly to get statistical significance, which is also really nice. The downside, it can be computationally expensive, especially the uh, multi-pass version. I have a link on there um, to a former student of mine who should have been in the pictures, I just realized, but he graduated a year ago and I, I took him out of the pictures, but that is an open source implementation of permutation importance that's on GitHub and you can go see. Um, so looking at the first one, we're gonna do the forward algorithm and then we'll just briefly talk about the back backward algorithm. The forward single pass algorithm, the way that it works is you pretend you have these five, one, two, three, four, five, six variables here. And you, you go through and you permute each one of them one at a time. So that's shown by the changing them into random boxes here. And when you permute it, it's randomly, it's breaking all the associations between the predictor and the label. And then you, once you have this permuted data, you score your model with that data permuted. And you do that for each one of them, and then you just rank them all and say which one had the, the worst score degradation when you permuted the data. Well, the one that degraded the score the most clearly was the most important to the model. Um, and this was proposed by Bryman when he introduced decision trees. 
you can do it backwards instead of forward and I don't have an animation for that. But basically you start with all the variables permuted and then you just unpermute one at a time and score the model and that that can work as well. The multi pass version is almost the same as the single pass version. You, the first pass through does exactly what the previous one did, but then you keep that variable permuted and now you look for the next most the next variable causing the, the highest score degradation and you do that all the way through until you have a full ranking. So that's what's shown with the animation here. And this was proposed by Lakshmanan um, for neural networks. And you can also do this one backwards as well, where you start with all the variables permuted and then you unpermute one at a time and keep the most important one unpermuted and you repeat until all of them are scored. So it's literally the same animation, but backwards. So the question that you might ask is, okay, you just gave me five different scoring methods for figuring out variable importance. And um, you know, how do I pick which one I should use? Well, the answer I'm going to give you is that you should use all of them or as many as are computationally feasible and you should use them to look for consistencies across the methods. So this on the right hand side of your screen here, you have some results there from a BAMS paper that we just had that came out in December. So you can go look at it in more detail. I have it says McGovern at all BAMS. And we explain the domains there. So I'm not, I don't have time today to explain the domains, but we were trying to predict um, the mode of a convective storm. So supercell, um, quasi-linear convective system, there were five different classifications. I don't remember all five off the top of my head, but trying to predict the convective storm mode. And then the other one's looking at winter precipitation, trying to predict whether it's going to be rain, freezing rain, snow, sleet, et cetera. And we just showed the variables that are most important. And there's what I wanted to show you with this graphic is not specific to that domain. What I want you to look at is to look and see the consistencies across the three different types. So what we did here is we did Gini um, imp impurity score using the Gini uh, impurity measure, single pass permutation and multi pass permutation. And those are both forward passes. We didn't do the backward passes. And what's most interesting is to look and see what's showing up very consistently. So for example, the convective storm mode, what matters is that wind shear is at the top, although it's a different measurement. Here it's the LCL to EL, whereas up here it's, it's zero to one kilometer AGL. So there, it's wind shear that matters, but it might be a slightly different variable and they may be correlated with each other. And it's important, the lesson I would give out of this is that it's important to use all of the methods to try to triangulate rather than to just take one of the methods and say, this gave me what I expected, so I'm gonna go with it. And that's what I see a lot of people beginning to do. And it's important to look at all the methods because it might give you something, some new scientific insight. And it might also just give you insight about your data. You might create some, one of these graphs and find out why in the world is that at the top? Oh, it's at the top because there's some strangeness in my data. Um, I have a second example from, uh, this is from Ryan Lagerquist's PhD thesis. Um, on tornado prediction and he compared the four permutation tests and this is on deep learning so showing you that you can do permutation tests on deep learning and he did forward and backward and single pass and multi pass so that's what you've got the four panels there and again my take home message is not so much what's really important for this if you want to read that go read the paper my take home message is that you understand that there are multiple methods for ranking variable importance and that you go and perhaps do all of them so that you can see the triangulation of the answers and in particular, if you only use one, you can fall into the confirmation bias trap, which is that, oh, I think reflectivity is going to be the most important. And so I do this one test, for example, and reflect that wasn't supposed to flip. Reflectivity shows up as the most important. So I'm just going to say I'm done. I expected this and this is what I got. You should run the test so that you see that, in fact, reflectivity is the most important across all the methods. OK. Um, so given, so that's the permutation importance, which by the way, one of the other speakers yesterday talked about as well when she was talking, um, I believe her name is Katie, she was from NCAR, she was talking about using machine learning for land surface models and she used permutation importance as well. Um, so you, you can see that it works across a wide variety of domains. What I wanna do is continue down the um, path of model agnostic ones before we spend more time in the uh, deep learning ones. So, there's another method called sequential search, which comes in a, a lot of flavors, more flavors than I can do today. 
We're going to talk very, very briefly about forward sequential search and backward sequential search. I have a reference there to one that's called randomized variable elimination, which is a way to try to get around some of the computational effort involved, particularly in the backward sequential search. Um, and there, you can also do genetic search on it. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, but the cool thing out of this, it is model agnostic, but it is hugely computationally inefficient. The way that this works, and we'll just explain the algorithm using the animations. L looking at sequential forward search, you drop all of your predictors and you run your model training with only one predictor at a time. And you say, is this any good? Is this any good? Is this any good? And you pick the best one. It might still be a terrible prediction, by the way, but you pick the best of all of them. And then you keep that in your model and then you go through and try to find the second most important one to add. And then the third most important one to add and the fourth most important one to add, et cetera. With backwards, you do almost the same thing, except for you start with everything and you see which one can you drop and get the least amount of loss. And you do that repeatedly as well. And you could, the problem with this is the reason that it's so computationally intensive, particularly backwards search, is that you're retraining the model n times for however many predictors you have. And if that model is really computationally intensive to train, say deep learning, this can be infeasible. However, if your model is feasible, like a random forest, or in um, the bottom case here, it's a, a support vector machine, with, with some caveats, some support vector machines can be really slow to run. Um, you can do this and it can give you a similar answer to the permutation importance. So it tells you which one was the most important. And so we have some results here again from the winter precipitation and just showing one of the things to get out of this graph is not exactly which one matters, but that they're very different depending on whether we went forward or backward. And, and they're also different across the two models. So the random forest and the, the, um, the radial basis function support vector machines have very different answers. And, and that, that's not necessarily a bad thing because then you can start to gain some physical insight into what really matters for each model. Uh, the only other thing I would say, I wanna emphasize the computational expense on this because the reason we weren't able to do this on anything other than a random forest and, an, and a, a small SVM is that it took too long even on a supercomputer for the jobs to finish. Okay. Um, moving on to the, the second to last of the model agnostic ones, this one was again mentioned yesterday. Um, one of the things that's happened with the previous methods is that we've only talked about what's important, but we don't talk about why it's important. And what it might really matter why it's important. So yesterday you saw an example of a partial dependence plot, um, but you get to see another one today. There are other kinds of plots that are very much related. Um, there's individual condi conditional expectation plots, Lyme, and there's more. And they basically all are different ways of looking at how the model behaves as a single variable changes. So you take one variable and you change its behavior and you see what the model does. Um, there are a couple of really good references that I put down there to learn about these, um, and they're both free books. They're available at those links, and I know the slides will be online later this afternoon. The Interpretable Machine Learning Book talks about how to do the methods and, and shows you lots of examples of it. And then um, Molnar and did a class on Interpretable Machine Learning and had his class write a book called Limitations of Interpretable Machine Learning. And they spend a lot of time talking about the cons of the different methods and the ways that they can break. And so both of those books are useful to, to go read. And they're both free online. So looking just specifically for today, for the matter of time, um, we're going to look at partial dependence plots. Partial dependence plots are, are relatively easy to do. You imagine that you have your data set, and for the moment I'm using a tabular data set rather than a, a, a deep learning data set. You set all the instances of one variable to a single value. So for example, I'm using temperature here, and I set it to 15. You pass that data to the model, whatever machine learning model it is, you calculate the mean prediction for that value. Now, yesterday's example um, showed the spaghetti plot of all of them, and I'm only going to show the, the average. I calculate the mean prediction for that value, and then you're going to change that value again. So you're going to change it to 16, 17, 18, et cetera. And you're going to calculate that mean prediction, and it's going to give you a graph. And you can do it with a graph that shows just the mean value like this, or you can do the spaghetti plot like you saw yesterday where the mean was highlighted, but you could see the overall behavior in the background of all of the examples. And both of those are valid ways to look at it. But what you can see 
this is a um, particular example from our winter precipitation uh, problem. You can see that there's an inflection point in the predictions um, it, in a particular, those uh, temperatures are uh, not, not in Celsius, clearly. I think those are Kelvin. Um, it's been a while since I made that graph. But there, there's an inflection point where the, the precipitation is changing type. Okay. Um, one more while we're looking at model agnostic that I think is really, really important. And by the way, I'm going to stop and do questions before we um, skip into deep learning, but I'm not doing it yet. One more while we're looking at model agnostic methods is to look at case studies. And in particular, in those case studies, we might want to look at when things work and when things don't work. And so case studies, when you're some of the people who've been talking here are trained as, as uh, atmospheric scientists and then they're learning the machine learning and some people are trained as machine learning scientists and they're learning the atmospheric science. And I fall into that second category. I'm a machine learning person. My PhD is in machine learning, computer science specifically. All of my degrees are in computer science except for one that also has math on it. And so I had to learn the atmospheric science. And coming from the machine learning background, we don't tend to do case studies. We tend to do overall aggregate performance. We look at the area under the curve. We look at the root mean squared error, things like that. Coming into the atmospheric sciences, I learned how important it is that we talk about case studies because case studies really, really matter. It matters to the meteorologists who are going to use your method that they can trust your method in a variety of regimes. So they want to see that it works in extreme cases and they want to see that it works in not extreme cases. They want to see all the regimes. And so I have an example here um, from our hail paper, which is referenced there as well, where we're using machine learning to do hail prediction. And uh, we, so this is looking at um, a particular case study day, uh, July 29th, 2018. And the dots are the hail events. And then we're looking at the different predictions. So the different probabilities uncalibrated, calibrated, and then um, calibrated in different ways. And by doing this case study, we can go through and decide which one is the best. And we can look at the humans and have the humans look at it and tell us which one they think is also the best. So we did, for example, a case study this year where we were testing this method in the hazardous weather test bed, which did happen this year. It was entirely virtual over Zoom. And we have this tweet that I just love. Adam Clark put out this tweet. He said, CAMs don't simulate, directly simulate severe weather, so computing model-derived tornado, hail, wind probabilities is hard. Storm proxies are useful, but AI could be a game changer. And he's not showing an overall performance graph. He's showing a case study where we nailed it. This is the predictions of the hail that day and then the actual hail reports, and our AI algorithm nailed it. And that just shows how much the case studies matter. And again, if you're really interested, by the way, in our new um, weighting method for this, just as a, a, as a side thing, it did work really, really well this year. There will be a paper that we're working on, and there'll be additional evaluations coming out. Um, but Hazardous Weather Testbed just finished about two weeks ago. Now, in addition to those case studies, so looking at specific days, for example, where it hails or where it was a high risk for hail, but a low risk for hail, looking at all those, perhaps looking at hail, you might want to look at hail in the southeast versus hail in the north, northwest. You know, what are the different kinds of hail that occur? Because hail in Florida and hail in Oklahoma, for example, are very different. And then hail in Colorado is different still. All of those matter. Another way that you could look at the case studies is to study the predictions in the four cells of the contingency table. And of course, if you're doing a non-binary problem, there could be more cells and you might want to study them. Um, but you might want to look at individual cases in those cells and you might want to look at aggregate cases in those cells. So it matters which cases you're getting right, your hits. It also matters which cases you're getting right that were should have been wrong or should have been a no. So if you're predicting tornadoes, you matter, you care the tornadoes that actually hit, you could care about the ones that you correctly said there was no tornado. But it also matters the off diagonals. You care about the ones you said there should have been a tornado and there wasn't, and you care about the times where you said there wasn't a tornado and there was. And you want to look at those individual cases so that you get an understanding of why your algorithm is working. Um, and we, in the graphs that I'm about to show you, um, we used graphs of average performance for the 100 best, or the 100 cases in each one of those, and we used probability match means to create the graphs. But you can also individually examine the cases, which we did as well, but I'm not going to show you that. So I'm not going to spend time on the meteorological details here. What I want to show you is that you can do this probability match mean for the best hits, and this is from Ryan Lagerquist's dissertation. Um, and I realized that it didn't say LogRequest on it. It should. Um, 
this is his dissertation work. And it, we're looking at the 100 best hits, the probability match mean for the 100 best hits. And what you can see out of looking out of that is that if you step back and you think, how am I evaluating my model? Well, the cool thing out of this is that my model has built something that said that storms that have an average, it, it's a hook echo there, have a very high probability of a tornado. So 99.2% probability of there being a tornado, as long as they have all of these features and you have to look at all the features and decide whether they're meteorologically relevant and they're labeled there. As I said, I'm not dwelling on the meteorology of this so much as dwelling on the idea that you can use these case studies to really understand what's going on inside your model. And in particular, looking at all four parts of the contingency table, you could look at the false alarms next. And so these are the ones that you predicted would be a tornado, but they were not actually a tornado. And so what Ryan did with this, he looked at this and he said, these look really similar. If I flip back and forth, those don't look dramatically different. So he went through and he looked at the individual storms. And one of the things that was interesting is that 76 of the 100 storms had a tornado warning on them from the weather forecasters. So they were false alarms for the humans as well. So although our algorithm didn't do perfectly, it also was falling into whatever the same uh, issues or that the human forecasters were. And our theory on this is basically that there were, that you know a funnel cloud that comes down that almost touches down gets ranked as a no tornado. But if it manages to touch all the way down, even if it's just a weak tornado and it's brief, then it's a tornado. So there's a little bit of a dichotomy here. And that's probably why the worst false alarms don't look terribly different from the, the best hits. And likewise, you can look at the worst misses. Um, and then you can look at the best correct nulls. And one of the things you're seeing as you go through these is that the best correct nulls look like pretty much not a storm. And that's nice to see that the models learn something that matches our intuition. And I think I'm like almost halfway through time, I'm gonna stop and bring up the Slido so that I can answer questions for just a few minutes. Unfortunately, my laptop went to sleep, so I can't see the Slido. Okay. Um, so Karthik's going to time me so that I only do five minutes. How does forward and backward selection work on correlated features? What's the best way to analyze machine learning models built with correlated features? That is an excellent question. Um, I would actually say that the, so all of the, the methods that we talked about, I'll go back. That's actually why I didn't want to pop into Slido and why I'm using the slides so I can go back to look at the slides. So the permutation methods will do better at handling the correlated features because if you have two features like in, the, like in this graph, um, let's say just call them A and B and they're co highly correlated with each other, once you've permuted, they might not look great together, but they should show up next to each other in the order in the rank. So that if A is really, really uh, correlated with B and A is important and you selected A in the prediction, then B should show up as the next one that's ranked because as soon as you pulled A out and made it randomized, now B is going to show up as being important. So the correlations can show up next to each other. And if you do the backwards version, it can also help to handle the correlations. The selection methods have, have the same trouble, right? If you're just doing a single pass and you're only looking at one feature at a time, it can be hard to deal with the correlations. My other advice on that is to do, to actually, I didn't put this into the plots, but to do something like choreograms and put in, look at the correlations. And then when you decide that, the, that you might get rid of some things, that if you already just do a, 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 a correlation between all of your features and you say that, oh, these two features are correlated at like 0.9, well, why do you need them both? So you might just simply decide to cut some of them out from the beginning before you even start learning. But well, you could also do it backwards. You could do these methods and then you could do that choreogram and you could find the story together. So I would say you, you put those two things together. Um, how does one interpret um, model interpretation? Ah, my laptop's trying to go to sleep, sorry. How does one interpret model interpretation and visualization methods that show different variable importance? My answer to that is gonna be that you're gonna use your physical intuition. Um, and, and that's what I was trying to show here and that you're trying to use it as a triangulation so you want to see the same answer showing up across all of the methods. And if it's showing up across all of the methods, then it's most likely truly important as opposed to just a fluke of the method that you did. So if in this case for tornadoes, for example, um, something that's in our data that doesn't show up in the top 10 had showed up on one of them in the top 10, then I would care about understanding what had gone wrong in that case. 
Whereas what we saw here was that there's a pretty consistent story. You can see reflectivity and vorticity show up as the top two across all of them, which is what you probably would physically expect for tornado problems. So I think the answer to that is you just, you try to, this is where it really, really matters that you're using your earth science or atmospheric science knowledge along with your machine learning knowledge so that you're actually putting the two together to try to understand the answers and not just blindly accepting them. How do you decide the best cost function or algorithm to use? I, I'm not sure where you're going with that. Cost functions I haven't even talked about yet. Um, if you mean the best model interpretation visualization algorithm to use, you're gonna pick the one, my answer to that is try to use as many of them as you can. Um, not just use one specifically, as many as you can computationally afford and you triangulate the answer. I'll think, I think Karthik, do I have time for one more? Karthik didn't yes. answer. Okay, yes, sorry. You do. I can't see the Zoom screen because I'm, I'm in full screen. Um, in terms of the important scores and sequential search, are you retraining the model with permuted and drop features or the model stays frozen? Oh, that's an excellent question. Okay, there are two answers to that. For the important scores, for permutation and for um, impurity importance, the model's frozen. You're just evaluating the model, which matters computationally. For the forward and backward sequential search, you're rebuilding the model, which matters computationally. They are much more computationally intensive than just the permutation, and permutation is already more computationally intensive than impurity. But because you've already trained the model with permutation, all you're doing is evaluating what happens when you randomize the data. Sequential search, you're retraining the model at every single pot potential combination. I think, Karthik, are we out? I'm assuming that was my five minutes. Yeah, that, that's good. Okay, I'm gonna get back up. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back and we'll do another set of questions at the end. Um, what I wanna do is I want to, and, and plus I understand there's a panel this afternoon, so I wanna answer all your questions. Um, we're gonna move to doing model interpretation for deep learning. And I'm only going to do a couple of them. And um, so I'm doing the first set of the list. And then um, Emma's going to talk about LRP as well as some other methods. I swear this is the only slide that has math on it. Um, but I wanted to put the math there just so you could see it. Um, saliency is the first method that we're going to look at. And saliency is defined as the gradient of the model activation with respect to the input value. And I'm jumping right into the idea that you've looked at all the deep learning methods so that I'm assuming you know what a deep learning um, model is. And we're not talking about how you have to take all those gradients. But mathematically, we've got the definition of saliency there. And basically, what saliency is doing is it's taking a linear approximation around that point as you perturb that point from its initial point. And so I wanted to show you how you could use this. Now, this is actually combining the saliency with the idea of doing case studies. So we took those 100 best hits, and then we did saliency maps on each one of them individually. And then we put the, um, that average saliency map on top of the average storm. And what we get is we get to see, and I, that's a white arrow on a white screen. Um, what we get is that you can see parts of the screen that matter. So for example, the, the probability of a tornado is increasing with the vorticity in the mesocyclone at the low levels, which makes physical sense. Um, and the probability of tornado increases as the reflectivity goes, it gets higher in the cores. And so that's what these, these uh, lines are the, the um, map of the saliency on there. I'm going, I'm gonna go sort of quickly on the saliency so we can talk, so that was just brief on saliency maps because I wanna spend some more time on some of the others. And also because like I did with the other ones, I wanna say that you're gonna use uh, several of these so that you can triangulate answers. I don't think that you should just take saliency maps of which I could show you 10 slides and say, that's it. I understand everything my model is doing, my deep learning model is doing. I think you should triangulate it by using all of the methods that we're gonna talk about. So the next one I wanna look at is called backwards optimization. It's also called feature optimization. There are other words for it in the literature. It was introduced by Ola in 2017, and it's actually a really cool journal paper um, because it's an interactive journal paper. It's not a PDF, it's an online journal paper. And you can play with the examples in it. So it's pretty cool and you can go in and understand it. Um, you can, the idea of backwards optimization is you can create synthetic input examples that maximize the activation of some model component. And you can pick which model component you care about. So it might be the output probability, it might be something in one of the inner layers. Basically backwards optimization is doing gradient descent, but it's doing it backwards. And you need to give it an initial seed. And there's actually a recent paper that talks about um, 
what the initial what the effect of the initial seed might be. What we have found is that if you use a uniform image or a random image that you don't get things that look as physically plausible as if you start from an example from your actual reality and then just work to tweak the example. And so that's what we did in our work. So looking at this is a link to that pub, the publication I was just talking about as well. This is a graphic from it. Looking at the different components. These are all the ways in which you could visualize the different layers using backwards optimization. So you could do the channel activations, you could do a spatial activation of a particular uh, part of the image, you could look at the individual neurons. On this graphic, again, from Ryan Lagerquist's uh, PhD thesis, um, and, and I had the citations earlier and I have them again at the end, um, we use backwards optimization to take tornadic storms and try to create the optimal non-tornadic storm. So in the upper left here, we have the original data that was going in, and then how it changes the data shows up on the right. And one of the things that's interesting out of this backwards optimization, it takes the probability of there being a tornado from 99.2 to 6.9, but it doesn't look hugely different at the, at the lower levels. I mean, there is definitely a difference, but it's not huge. One of the things that changes at the upper level, the reflectivity core has definitely decreased and the vorticity is lower, but it's not huge. Now, one of the other things that you could look at, we also changed the sounding and the sounding did change. You got the, the original sounding and then what the backwards optimization did to the sounding, but this is where I wanna start with a caveat. Some of these methods, can, because they're not embedded in the physics, can create things that don't necessarily look physically realistic. So this is actually what we got when we had no physical constraints on the data. That sounding's sort of crazy. And you might throw that in your model and then get backwards, you know, come out with your backwards optimization and say, this is no good, I don't wanna do it. It's no good. Well, it is good. It can give you answers, but what we had to do to make it look better was to incorporate some physical constraints so that the, the, the answers were more physically realistic. And this is just beginning work, um, but, as we incorporate more and more physical constraints into the backwards optimization, we're going to be able to say that the, the optimized synthetic images that come out in synthetic examples are physically plausible because this isn't particularly physically plausible. Okay. Um, there are a couple of methods out there that, um, that there's CAM and there's GRAGCAM and GRAGCAM is a generalization of CAM. So we're only going to talk about GRAGCAM but they are class activation maps. I have the references there. They look at the evidence on the, on the data for the positive class. And one of the nice things about it, just like the other methods, that it can be defined at a grid point, and so you can turn the class activation answers into a map. And I gave a, I'm giving a short um, comparison between class activation, which by this I mean the gradient class activation, GradCam, um, versus saliency. So CAM gives you one value per grid point, CAM is non-negative only, so saliency could give you negative evidence. Um, CAMs highlight the values for the predictions, whereas saliency focuses on the changes. You're doing small changes in your data. And CAM can be, is specific to a convolutional layer. So looking at that same tornadic data, also again from Ryan Lager for his PhD dissertation, um, we have looking at tornado evidence We've got graphics that just, so we're showing you where it's positive and it's showing, for example, that the tornado evidence is maximized on the right rear flank. So down near the, the uh, hook echo, for example. And again, we're not focusing so much on the atmospheric part of this. For you, we're focusing on the idea that the methods are there, but I want you to see that, you know, by comparing, for example, the saliency map to this CAM map, you can see that the model really does care about this area using both measurements of, of importance. And in this case, we're looking at the best hits and the worst misses so that we can see what's going on inside those worst misses. And the area with the tor zero tornado evidence looks, it looks like if you compare between the best hits and the worst misses, that these are more embedded in another storm. So that's an interesting result as well. Okay, so I'm gonna take all of those methods and I'm gonna throw statistics at it because statistics really, really matter. So, uh, there's a paper by Adebayo who proposes that we take, now his paper is very specific to saliency maps, but he proposes that you do three different sanity checks on your saliency maps in order to make sure that your saliency maps are not giving you something that's just completely random. And LogRequest 
Um, and, and again, another paper that we're working on that's in preparation is adding statistical testing for the CAMs as well as the sal san uh, saliency maps and the other maps. So the idea is that you can compare your maps to an edge detector, that is just a random vision edge detector. So ed vision, vision, vision processing systems are really good at finding edges right now. So you would like to compare your saliency on an edge detector versus your saliency on what your method actually learned to make sure that your method didn't just learn what an edge detector is. You wanna compare before and after randomizing weights on a layer. This is getting back to the permutation, but to make sure that you're actually learning something that really matters. And you wanna compare it to a model trained on random labels. So it's possible that your model has got some overfitting in it. So if you train against a model that should presumably be random, um, you can compare your results on that as well. And then you, you, in addition to just Adebayo talks about just visually comparing those, we're extending that to talking about doing statistical testing on this. So you can do bootstrapping on it and the procedure is actually outlined in those two papers. So I don't, again, in an hour, don't get time to go through the full procedure, but you can use bootstrapping so that you can get statistical significance at each grid point and find out how much it matters that your saliency map, for example, said that this part was really important or that your grad cam map said that this part was really, really important. So I have a small set of results. Um, these are from a paper that we're working on submitting, should be submitted in the next week or so. We have the actual map. Um, this, these, is our, these are for um, Sandy checks. Or for, so the three different kinds of Sandy checks are shown on here. So you've got the original map, you've got the edge detector, you've got the data randomization, so you randomize some layers, and then you've got the labels that are shuffled. And then you are comparing, the, so the stippling, which is probably hard to see in the shared screen, but you've got the, first of all, you have the, the saliency maps for the different three different, the four different models. And then you have a statistical comparison to tell you whether or not it's statistically significantly different from the original one. So from this one in the upper left-hand corner. And all of those dots tell you the regions where it's statistically significantly different. And the cool thing is, that by looking across all of these models, you have very strong evidence that the saliency maps that are learned in the original one, so on the true data without any of this randomization, without edge detection, are reflecting physical, meaningful relationships because there's very low statistical significance in the main parts of the storm. So this other coloration is actually just the saliency map, right? This part, the part that you caring about looking for is the stippling. And there's very little stippling in the main parts of the storm overall. Okay, I'm probably talking too fast, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go through a lot of questions at the end as well. Um, we have one more method we're gonna talk about. Um, so this last method, I, it's called novelty detection. And the idea with this one is actually getting into the idea that I talked about, and that I think Emma's gonna talk about in much more detail in the next hour is that, is there a way we can use all of this model interpretation and visualization to learn science? And not just to verify the physical relationships that we've learned, which in it, it some sense, looking at all of these, it, it's really, really important to understand what's going on inside our model. And it's really, really important that our models verify the physical relationships that we know that exist. But it would be really awesome if you could give it some data and it could learn new science. It could learn something and hand it to you and say, here's a hypothesis, can you go investigate this? And you investigate it and you don't just find out that it's an artifact of your data, for example. You find out that it's something really cool and new. And the idea of novelty detection is, is going down that path. Um, the paper that this is presented from, and then it has been used as well on a Mars rover. So it's from Wagstaff and Lee, and they use this method on a Mars rover that's actually on Mars um, to figure out what's novel about the images on Mars because they, can't, they don't have the bandwidth from Mars to here. The internet connection's a little bit slow and you can't sign up for fiber. And so they need to be able to send only the images that really matter or only the regions that really matter. So they're trying to find the novel science. And it's using the deep learning that we've been talking about. So the, the cool thing that happens is that the way that works, it uses one of the UNETs, um, which you've, you've learned about already um, earlier this week. And then it's using another method called singular value decomposition. And so the idea is that you take your images, you train your network, you train you, you do a unit and you do, so you do a unit to, to reconstruct your images. 
and you cut the middle of the unit so that you have a latent space representation and you do singular value decomposition on that latent space representation so that gives you eigenvalues and eigenvectors and then you train something from that eigenvalues and eigenvectors to it's an, I call it an up -conf net where you try to recreate the image and that can tell you what when you give it another image you can see how how it how well it regenerated the image that you expected and what's novel about it and I just have an example. This is from our BAMS paper that I referenced earlier. Um, we have, we're looking at strong rotation. So this is mesocyclone rotation, not tornadic rotation. We were unable to use this method to get results that looked beautiful in tornadoes. Um, and that doesn't mean that the method is a failure. I think that the idea is interesting, just that it's definitely got some caveats to it the way backward, backwards optimization did. You gotta be careful to make sure that your method is finding something that's physically relevant. But I wanted to show how it works. So the baseline here, you, you train a baseline of storms. So we had 100 random storms, mostly not rotating storms. And then we give it a test set of storms with strong rotation. And we want to see what's different. So this is the input. And then this is the up net reconstruction. And it's the most novel example. And it's showing you that what matters is this area in the middle where there's strong wind. And so this is the reconstruction and the way you get the novelty is to look at the difference between the reconstruction and the original image. And the, the region that is most novel is right there in the center of the storm where it's strongly rotating. Well, that matches with our physical intuition. Um, and I said that one was gonna be short. Um, the, where we're going with this, we, this, the idea of doing model interpretation is a huge and growing field. It really matters. Uh, we are working on developing and validating a lot more trustworthy AI model interpretation techniques. We want them to work not just for earth science, but for a, a, a variety of methods. We want them to be general to other AI and machine learning uh, fields where they're being applied, you know, for example, medical. Um, we wanna validate the techniques on our targeted end users. So a lot of the methods that I showed you, I'm showing you graphics that I would show another researcher but that might not be, for example, a graphic that I would show an emergency manager in order to make them trust the method. So we need to figure out, and this is really important for us as AI researchers in general, and it goes back to my slide that I had at the very beginning. If you want people to trust your methods and you want people to understand that there's, for example, no bias in your method, you need to be able to communicate your method. And that means communicating it to the end users who are gonna use it. And the, most of the time, the end users are not your fellow researchers. Most of the time, the end users are other people general public, emergency managers, trained forecasters. It depends on what it is you're working on, but it's not likely to be your fellow grad students or fellow faculty or whoever all is on the call, fellow, fellow private sector people. It's, you need to pay attention to who those people are and you need to really understand their needs. We're working to, my research group, we're working to develop um, additional techniques specialized specifically for earth science. We want to incorporate, incorporate the physical constraints like we talked about with backwards optimization. That's just the beginning of it because that really matters as part of the trust. One of the complaints that gets made about machine learning and in particular about deep learning is it's not learning anything physical. And since my NWP model is physical, by golly, I can't use this deep learning method because it's not physical. We could have a whole discussion about that offline, but in particular, let's just focus on getting some physical constraints into there. Um, and we had a talk about that yesterday, and I believe we have another one, um, two talks from now. So Emma's next and then Mike Pritchard. Um, we need to develop, our, we need to make sure that our techniques uh, handle high spatial and temporal autocorrelation. And if you're an earth scientist, you're just used to spatial and temporal autocorrelation. If you're a machine learning trained person, that's rather new because most machine learning data doesn't come with high spatial or temporal autocorrelation. And then finally, we need to make sure that all of our techniques that we're doing for interpretation and visualization handle rare phenomena because most interesting problems in earth science have some rarity to them. Um, okay, and then finally, the last thing I would like to be able to, to take this, all of these things we're doing and put them into a feedback loop where we take the model interpretation results and what people actually think about using our models and improve the machine learning itself. And so maybe the machine learning can be improved and the, the model itself will be better and then we become a cycle. I'm going to um, leave the references up for a second and then I can switch over to Slido in a second, but I'll leave the references up so that you can, you can grab them. And because we're required to do these things, my funding sources are going to appear there briefly as well. They are very important as well. I'm gonna put it back to the references and then I will take questions. I have to reopen my laptop and get over to the Slido. And my laptop decided to go to sleep again, so. 
you have plenty of time for questions, Amy. Okay, good. Um, that's because I talk fast. <laughs> okay, um, the top question. I've noticed that random forest is a common method used in severe weather prediction. Would you say this is consistently the best method for this area? That's an excellent question. And actually, the questions look pretty general. I'm going to switch out of sharing. And I think that I was told that if I did that, you would switch to sharing the Slido deck. So I'm going to do that. And then I think the NCAR people put the Slido deck back in the background. Um, but I'll keep answering. So random forests are definitely used very consistently. And one of the reasons that they're used consistently is they have very strong performance. They're easy to use. There's already existing libraries out there to do so. And they don't require the learning curve that deep learning requires. So they are definitely a great method. I don't know if they're going to be the best as we go on. I think deep learning is proving its chops very, very well, but I certainly wouldn't discount random forests. And in fact, one of the things I teach my machine learning class is that they should always pick the simplest answer to the problem. This is Occam's razor. And when you pick the simplest answer to the problem, then you should, you should try random forest before you try deep learning. And all the deep learning people are probably gasping in the background, but I think you should try the easy answer first. Um, I have a question, Karthik. Is it sharing the Slido deck or do you want me to, because I, I thought it was going to show up. Yeah, go ahead, show the Slido. Yeah, it should pop up in a second. Okay. Um, I'll just keep answering questions and assume that somebody's going to put the Slido deck up. Okay. Uh, if two features are highly correlated linearly, for example, 0.8, can their relative importance still be significantly different because of the extreme events? There we go. That'll make it a little easier than having to stare at my screen next to me. I got to read that one again and think about it. Is that Philippe? Um, if two, two, two features are highly correlated linearly, can their relative importance be significantly different? Yes, I think they could be. Um, but it's probably more likely they're going to be close to each other in importance. Um, that's something that one would need to investigate. I'm going to say that that's a hard one, and I, I, we need to really investigate it. But I suspect the answer is that they don't have to be. They're not required to be next to each other. Um, even though the impurity importance is only available for tree-based methods, is it also more prone to biases? You did not sound enthusiastic. <laughs> yes, um, I think it is also prone to biases. It's definitely, because it's very much built on how the model was put together. And I didn't go into this, but forests and trees in general are um, what they call brittle methods. So a brittle method means that if you make a very small change in your data, that you get a very large change in your model. And random forests take advantage of the brittleness in order to make an ensemble of, method, of, of forests that are different, because if you just made an ensemble of all the same thing, it will be boring. And, but because the impurity importance relies on the actual tree structure, it relies on a model that is brittle. So I find it to be more prone to biases, which is why I am not enthusiastic. The other reason I'm not enthusiastic is the, as an editor for weather and forecasting, which is what I am now, I take a lot of the AI papers from weather and forecasting. Um, people will submit something. They'll talk about, I did importance. I did variable importance and they just used impurity importance and they use it as confirmation bias only. They'll say basically like it's the word of God that came down and said, this is what's most important. And it, it frustrates me because it really isn't the only answer. One needs to look at all of the answers. So that, that's, my, that's why I didn't sound enthusiastic. Um, what are the advantages and limitations of importance we are getting from random forests? Advantages, you're definitely getting to peer inside the model. You're getting to understand what variables are most important. The limitation, I would say, of the variable importance, permutation, impurity, any of them, is if you're not using something like the, um, the later methods we were talking about, like uh, the, the um, individual conditional exploitation plots and the partial dependence plots, is that you don't see why they're important. And it really, really matters why they're important because it's possible that what you're seeing is something that's important because there's a strange thing in your data. So I just read a paper recently that I'll give an example to. It was about um, looking through image detection. And they, one of the things they found was that all the images of horses in their data, it was not an atmospheric science paper, all the images of horses turned out to have an extra label down in the lower left-hand corner and the humans hadn't even paid attention to it. And so the model was able to find that, but the only way you're going to find that that's a artifact of your data is if you look at the why and not just the what variable is important. So I'd say that's a limitation. Oh, wait. Oh, they're just changing in votes. Okay. <laughs> I was about to answer one and it moved. 
Um, any suggestions for extreme event prediction? I was told neural networks is bad at predicting peaks. Oh, oh, hard question. Um, extreme event prediction is really hard. My answer to that is going to be twofold. Um, and I think some of the other talks have alluded to it. First of all, you shouldn't train your data on really, really rare data. So if you're trying to do um, probability of tornado, I'll use that as an example. Tornadoes are actually really rare, right? At any given moment in 3D space, there's not a tornado. And anybody could be a really good tornado predictor by saying no. But that's a useless tornado predictor because it doesn't actually tell you anything when it's happening. So to go back to the neural network or any model, you need to, in the training data, skew your data a bit so that the rare event is more likely. And then, of course, it's really, really important if you skew your training data that you pay attention to your testing data and make it actually climatologically relevant. But that's the way to get your network to, tr to, to do better. The other half of that answer is that um, I think we talked about one of the other talks talked about this. You can take your data and you can change your data up a little bit. You can, um, you can add random noise. You can rotate your images. You can model. It's called data augmentation. And you can, you can try to augment your data. One of the tasks I didn't talk about today, we have a, a data set that's hand labeled by a human. And that human can only label so much data, right? So we augment all the data that the human created, but we don't augment the data that's the null cases because we have infinite amount of null cases. So you can, you can, we were able to augment our data set by 32 times the original data set size. So that's another way that you can handle extreme events. So I don't think that it's, that, that any of the machine learning models are bad at predicting the peaks. It's that you need to pay attention to your data processing, which David emphasized on day one. Okay. Um, whether the deep networks can be trained to learn the complex hidden structures in the highly nonlinear dynamics purely from restricted data. Um, so can they be trained to learn the complex hidden structures from, from the, oh, in the highly, so this is basically asking, I think, I'm, I'm looking at that and I think that you're asking, can we learn the physics? And I think the answer to that is yes, but it is certainly ongoing research that is just beginning. And so can we, can we, given, given a data-only view, learn the physics? And I think the answer is going to be yes, but it's going to require both training the neural networks, for example, as well as putting in some physical constraints. And there is some work out there that shows that putting in the physical constraints can make the neural network not learn. But in this case, I, we're going to talk about that. It, you can do it, but it's very much ongoing research. Um, OK, if backward and forward methods don't converge, doesn't that cut against the interpretability argument? I wish this was interactive. I'm glad I get to answer questions, but I would really like to ask questions back to the people. <laughs> if backwards and forward methods don't converge, so by not converging, meaning they don't give you an answer, they're going to give you an answer. They're going to, you're going to get a ranking. There's going to be a ranking out of them. So I don't see that that one, but I'm guessing I'm missing the point of that question. I'm sorry. If it can get clarified and get voted up, that would be great. Um, what are the essential structures required in the deep network to gain the ability to capture extreme events? Ooh. I think I partially just answered that. I think that it's got to be the, it, you've got to pay attention to the data that's coming in. If you just naively give it your data and your data, your events are super, super rare, it's not going to capture them. I don't think there's anything physically essential. It's just so much as you need to pay attention to giving it a good data set. And that relates to the question, which is now bumped up to the top, which is how do you bring physics into the neural network? I think you're going to have a couple other talks on that. So that's a very long question. Um, we did it by incorporating. So the physics that I talked about, we're working at backwards optimization. And we were incorporating it into the actual gradient descent um, approach so that we were saying that you can't go down this, this path using hard physical constraints, but they're, when you're going feed forward, if you're talking about how to do, to have the neural network learn a physical answer, um, it's a lot harder. It tends to come into the loss function and you have to pay careful attention so you don't make it an unsolvable problem. And I'm gonna let the other speakers who are talking about it in more detail tackle that in more detail because they have an hour on it. Um, what are your best practices for using case studies and empirical scoring criteria in evaluating model performance? Can case studies lead to confirmation bias? Ooh, yes, I think they can, but 
I'll, maybe I'll go with the first half first and then I'll come back to the second half. What are the best practices for case study for case studies? I think the best practices are do all of the parts of the, the contingency table and that helps go with the leading not getting confirmation bias. If you only did the main diagonal, which is the ones you got right, you're likely to give yourself confirmation bias. And then if you go to the off diagonals and see exactly what you did wrong, that's the key to not having confirmation bias. You need to make sure that you are looking at what you did wrong as well as what you did right. And I think that's the answer to the best practices. The scoring criteria needs to be based on whatever matters to you and your users. So I'm not gonna give you a specific scoring criteria like CSI or AUC, because it needs to be what matters to your users. Do I have one more minute or am I done, Karthik? Yeah, you have a minute. Okay. I also see that in the Zoom, Emma has said that I should plug that there's a workshop on physics guided machine learning in August. So Emma, when you start in 10 minutes, uh, plug that harder because I think that that sounds like something that people really want. Um, for permutation importance, what is the difference in practice between whether forward or backward passes are implemented? Um, forward is a lot less computationally complex. That's the answer to that. So most people tend to just do forward because it is faster. And by faster, it's a tremendous amount faster. Um, so that's, that, that's really the difference in practice. But as long as you have the computation time, do the other. Um, I almost was about to answer that one that just keeps disappearing, but I, I, I want that one. It just went up to the top. How quick is the machine learning field changing? How in the world do non-computer scientists keep up? That is a critical question and a great one to end on because even computer scientists have trouble keeping up. The answer is it's changing overnight. There are papers coming out constantly. I will add a few things to how you try to keep up. Um, Twitter is a great source um, there. If you pay attention to the, I know that Twitter can be the depths of despair. Don't pay attention to all of that. Twitter is a great source for technical communication. So a lot of people will tweet out their deep learning and machine learning papers. So you can look at those hashtags um, and then you can see what people are talking about. And then I would add that the amount of virtual things that are happening right now is another way to keep up because you can see a lot of different events. You can pop on, they're free. You can look at things on YouTube. There are a couple of YouTube channels out there that are dedicated entirely to explaining advances in machine learning. One of them that I like to watch is Two Minute Papers. Um, they're not really two minutes, by the way. They're like five minutes, but there's, he calls it Two Minute Papers. But he summarizes important papers that have come out over the last few, you know, like he does those once a week and he summarizes an important paper and you can get the gist of what's happening without having to go read each paper. And I think that's another way to keep up. It's just, it is incredible. It's a fire hose of information and you just have to, find lots of ways that you can do it that don't involve reading 50 papers a week because that's not physically possible for anybody. And I think Carly, right. can... okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. That was an excellent talk and lots of great questions. Uh, we will have time this afternoon for the panel discussion when we can have more questions come up uh, and, and all our panelists will be there to, to pitch in. Uh, we'll take a short break for about eight minutes and start at 10 minutes past the hour uh, with the next stop. Thank you.